And so I, I do think environment has such a, a large role in being specific about like, who do we want to be and who are the people we get to surround ourselves with to, that helps us be the people we want to be. We have Jonah Chow here. And she is on Raya. <laughs> so yeah, I got it a little mixed up there. But Jonah, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you guys? Excellent. Living and, the dream. Uh, how are you doing during the pandemic? Obviously, with the career, which we're going to get more into. Of course, Jonah, um, you know, an actress, just a laundry list of great uh, roles that you've played thus far. Plus, you do football professionally, <laughs> the ladies' football. She's got a hell of an arm. And uh, oh, thank you. you're just incredibly active and in, in, in doing so many great things. So how are you managing it during this time when, when it's really a challenge for everyone's mental health, let alone their career path? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I the, when we were first shut down last March, about a year ago, I think I, that first couple weeks was pretty rough because I'm an extreme introvert, uh, extrovert. So I like love being around people so that was difficult but i am really grateful for platforms like this like zoom um and getting to connect with awesome people like your, your guys yourselves so that has been really helpful for me and actually what's interesting is i actually have been working more on set during the pandemic than like the year prior to the pandemic so oh. i think yeah i'm really grateful so my experience <laughs> um i think a lot more unique than what most people might be experiencing right now yeah, absolutely. You know, we can actually kind of relate to that too, because due to the pandemic, a lot of actors and actresses and all the people that we've interviewed are available because not a lot of things were in production. So they're right. like, yeah, I could do a podcast. It's via Zoom. And we're just like, this is kind of selfishly working to our benefit. <laughs> so we're looking at the glass half full. We're in a pandemic as well. We're keeping our distance, you know, all that good stuff. But yeah, so. <laughs> We dig into uh, some of your background, and of course, we're in such an interesting time in our in our country. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, your, your projects that you've got going on now? Of course, the film that just hit Disney Plus got an earmark to watch. Tell us a little bit about uh, that role and how you got that character. Yeah, so I'm thrilled to be part of Raya and the Last Dragon. Um, we have Disney's first Southeast princess in Raya. She's this kick-ass warrior princess um, trying to uh, gather the dragon gems alongside her companions that she meets along the way um, to save the world. So it's really a story about unity and coming together and um, trust. Uh, so I think there's a lot of relevant themes that I think people of all ages can be really inspired by and enjoy like a fun, uh, funny adventure story along the way. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, young Jonah and what you were like, because uh, I love it, as you say, uh, was it uh, Chinese born, American raised, something along yeah. those lines? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was originally made in China. Made and, in China, yeah. And then I grew up in the United States. So I grew up in like upstate New York and then St. Louis. I consider St. Louis a home, my hometown. I think growing up, there's just I just felt very like other, like I was very different because I was Asian. Um, in my graduating class, there were about 500 or so students. So we had a decently big high school, about 500 graduating class. I think there was five of us that were Asian and I was friends with most of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I think it was just normal to feel like I was different or weird. And I luckily the last few years really embraced my ethnicity and my heritage, my background. But I think growing up, I was just so desperately trying to fit in, um, yeah. unfortunately. So. <laughs> that unfortunate, yeah, we try to fit in and then we want to be so different to differentiate <laughs> ourselves so much, especially working in Hollywood now as you do, right. <laughs> yeah, the irony. Well, what, what was it like not only for you, but your folks and did you have, do you have any siblings? Yeah, so I have a brother um, who is a few years younger than me. And, you know, it's like my parents, uh, I'm first generation. Um, my brother is second generation. He was born in the States. And I think it's 
like right now it, it's such a, a weird time and I'm glad that we're having these conversations um, around like race and uh, addressing some of the issues that we face as a society because I think it's so easy to just blame one person and go well yeah that guy's like crazy and messed up so you know just punish him and, and we're good to go but it really speaks to I think an issue with our society <laughs> like society as a whole and how do we all potentially how are we all maybe contributing to the issues that um, are happening right now so that yeah. it's systemic and societal and it's not just about these kooky random individuals you know yeah yeah because they're they're they're, they're a smaller part of a like you said a much bigger issue that's going on Absolutely. And, and I, you know, I've always considered myself an advocate of social justice. And in high school, I remember I was selected um, to be part of this leadership conference or leadership retreat. So we were going to go away for like a week and it was, um, you know, leaders selected from the various high schools in St. Louis area. And so, you know, we all came in like wanting to like change the world, make the world a better place. And <laughs> the first half, was pretty rough emotionally, but in a good way. Like we all had to, you know, we wanted to change the world, but we didn't realize how much we were contributing to all the isms of the world, sexism, racism, um, classism, like uh, just all the isms. So we first had to really examine ourselves and there was lots of crying, lots of breakdowns, lots of aha moments of like understanding the privileges that we inherently have, acknowledging them and seeing how we're contributing to the oppression, like the systems of oppression that are out there in like the way we speak, what we, we are, we're okay with other people saying around us, just, just kind of looking at all that and really it broke us down um, quite a bit. And then the second half was like, okay, so now how do we, how do we help change the world in some way? <laughs> but it was first really looking at ourselves and acknowledging um, the things that we do to contribute to the problem. And I think as a society right now, that is one good place to start is to do some introspection. Because I, I don't think most people would actually ever classify themselves as racist or sexist or any of them like it, but clearly it exists, right? So right, clearly right. It's not, <laughs> but um, most people don't ever see themselves in that way. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, no, I, th <laughs> I think yeah, I think it's that that self examination thing, and it's kind of uh, I was talking actually with my sponsor. I think the world would benefit from like a twelve step program because we focus on that ism a lot. And boy, you are looking in the mirror at, at your shit and how you. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great that you that you you went through and you're going through that journey, and I think um, more people could absolutely benefit from it, um, even if they're not struggling with like a particular specific addiction right now yeah uh, and, and i think it's hard for people to come to terms and grips maybe with some of their actions at certain times you know when they when they do stereotype us uh you know to poke at mikey a little bit he was joking with one of our our former guests we were recording you know because he's all tattooed up he goes into the store and and what occurs when you go in the store you know there's an the old lady with the purse that clutches the purse you know and i'm just like lady my arms cost more than your purse like <laughs> i'm not going to steal your purse <laughs> <laughs> yeah like we we have and and it's natural it, it's very biological for us to like if something looks different right than us in some way whether it's tattoos or, or skin color or whatever it, it people our brains naturally make categories, right? Because that's how we process things. It's like, mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, I, on one side, it, I think it's biological, but on the other, like as we get older and older and experience more of the world, like we can be more conscious about how some of those things come, come to our awareness and um, being more conscientious about how we react instead of just like reacting from like a very basic instinct. Yeah, it's kind of the, I've heard it referred to as the lizard brain, you know, the, the primordial part. And it's that, it, it's that, that, you know, how fear works for a mechanism in our brain, but because of the way that we now societally, you know, and structures change, classify everything and put it and all of a sudden this thing 
that for whatever reason triggered as a harmful type of thing. And so our brain immediately goes there without any sort of rational thought to it whatsoever. You know, it's kind of like, makes sense if you're standing at the edge of a cliff in 80 mile per hour winds, you want to get the hell away from the cliff. But it's a lot of these other things that it's like, that's not logic at all. That's not based in anything rational whatsoever. Right, exactly. No, I, I completely agree. So what was uh, Jonah like as a, as a little kid then? Obviously, you know, what, um, in the home, did, uh, you know, did your, were your folks English speaking as well when you came to the U.S.? Or was that kind of a process as well? And then going into school and being multilingual, what was the situation there for you? Sure. So Chinese, uh, Mandarin specifically, was my first language. And my, my parents were learning English. And I uh, learned English, I think, right around like age five when I was like in five-ish when I was in preschool um and I remember like just I would have nightmares about like the kids teasing me because I didn't know English and just like I would literally like <laughs> be worried about that and I remember going to uh, my like preschool teacher and like going <sighs> and she's like drinking fountain and I'm like <laughs> like Aww. Um, I don't know what I did to ask to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> I made. Um, <laughs> but I guess we figured it out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we mainly spoke Chinese. And then, like, as I got older, um, you know, I, I became fluent in English. Uh, we spoke a lot of Chinglish, which is a mix of Chinese and English. So just throwing different words um, in. And now, nowadays, I would say we speak, like, 75 to 80 percent English and then um like 20 percent Mandarin I always so, love the, I, over time. I always love those situations because I, I you know I've had people in my life that everything from being Persian to you know speaking Spanish or or like I said I had prior to recording had students that were Hmong and hearing that and then when they would go in and out it was always amusing because we like oh I, I got what you were saying you said that so many times I know it now Nice. I always yeah. thought that was so cool, you know, like my grandma, she was 100% Hispanic, and she would always try to teach my sister and I Espanol, and we just never, we never picked up on it, and I think it's so cool when people go from one language talking to this person to another language talking to that person, I'm just like, damn, that's dope, and I regret, I mean, I still could learn it if I wanted to, but I just regret not listening more when I was a young little fella. <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome to go back to from Mandarin to English. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm grateful that I got to uh, learn Mandarin for sure. Well, your parents sound like, A, you know, folks, it's, it's, it's funny. The, the couple of things that piss, piss me off, I'm going to sh share that is uh, not only when people come here, how difficult it is to make a move from a different country and a culture and everything else, let alone come here. And then the one that always pissed me off is, uh, why don't they speak English? It's like, part of my language, well, asshole, uh, why don't you try speaking Spanish, Chinese, whatever it is, and see how difficult it is for you, because people forget that we think in our language, and it's such a way to change, uh, you know, of everything. Yeah, absolutely, and I think uh, because of the number of Ch Chinese might be one of the most popular languages, it's not English, you know, I mean, English is growing. But in terms of the world population, you know, less people speak English, I think, than Chinese and some other languages. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, sorry, you were asking about the, what were you, sorry, I totally lost it. Oh, I, was like, okay. yeah, I, agree. I was like, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, uh, the transition, the transition, yes. right? Um, yeah, it was, it was, you know, I, I can't speak for what my parents' experience was like. You know, I moved. To upstate New York from China when I was very young, I was like one and a half, so I didn't really particularly feel that transition. But uh, my dad was from a very rural like farm in China with like lots of siblings. He like rare like growing up, he rarely got to eat meat because he would give it to his younger siblings because that's all they like they, they couldn't afford um, a lot of food. And so my dad just primarily ate rice and some vegetables. But he's like about he's about five foot five. When he came to the U.S., he was about 95 pounds. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I've seen pictures. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, now he's a very healthy, like, 
145 pounds, 150, something like that. Much healthier, but yeah, he was 95 pounds. Um, so we didn't come to this country with very much money. He got one of like five scholarships to attend Cornell University. Oh, wow, um, that's incredible. Yeah, so he worked incredibly hard to kind of rise above like the, you know, where, where he was living in China and like just trying to break out of that rural like farm life because that wasn't something that he wanted. Like he wanted to come here. And so we lived in a, in a trailer in upstate New York for many years while he was finishing his uh, graduate degree in Cornell. So. That's awesome. You can tell your dad you spoke with a guy today that didn't get into Cornell. I got rejected and he oh. got in. So your dad's way smarter than me. So you know, kudos to him. I did like two weeks out of junior college. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, I tried to get into the, the acting and film program there, and they were like, no, no, thank you. Oh, well. My dad likes to remind me that, like, uh, I think Cornell is a, an Ivy League school because no one really, can, like, no one thinks about Cornell when they think Ivy League. And he, he likes to I think, remind us all that it is. So it's, it's competitive. It's hard to get in. Most people get rejected, but you're in good company. Well, shit, if I went into Corn or got into Cornell, I would remind people of that every day. <laughs> right. Hey, how are you? Great, I went to Cornell. How are you? <laughs> right? You can't question Mr. Chow's uh, credentials here. He'll let you know. What do you guys want to eat today? Well, at Cornell, we used to eat this. I, I there. Um, uh, so you grew up in upstate uh, New York, eventually to St. Louis. Uh, as you said, one of five kids going through high school. Did you have a good high school experience? You spoke about going on that retreat and things of that nature, but did you have a good high school experience? And was there things that then fueled you? Because, you know, acting, it's that is just the crapshoot industry. I know I've done commercial acting and it's like, yes, I booked a gig and then realizing you lost more money than you made and you know, things <laughs> like that. So, yeah, I mean, acting can be. So tough and challenging for sure. I like, fell in love with acting when I was in sixth grade, when I was in uh, St. Louis, and um, I did Rapping Stiltskin, which is the rapping version of Rumpled Stiltskin. And for me, I love making people like smile and laugh and feel. And so uh, that's when I felt, fell in love with acting. And you know, growing up, you know, I I, I think overall I, I had a decent childhood. I mean, wasn't perfect. Um, you know, there was. Uh, I fought a ton with my dad. He's smart and he knows he's smart. So, <laughs> so we nailed him. <laughs> so he's extremely stubborn. And I think I, I'm fairly stubborn. I try not to be quite as stubborn as my father. So we would just fight about everything growing up. But I think being like Asian growing up had interesting challenges in that like, people, you know, and I think kids, it's like so much of it's how they're raised, the media, what influences they're seeing, you know, like I, my friends would get asked like, oh, like, why do you hang out with chinks? And, and, you know, I started to like, like hate the color yellow. Like, I think that was very symbolic of like maybe some self-hatred I had towards myself because I had learned that like yellow was a derogatory um, term for Asian. And I don't know, like a few weeks later, I found myself hating the color yellow and I was proud of hating the color yellow I didn't say like I wasn't like oh I, I hate Asian I was just like I hate that color every time I see that color I I can't stand it like I won't wear yellow I hate yellow mm -hmm. and so I think it, it was unfortunate I don't hate yellow anymore but I think there were some parts of that that was like maybe some self-hatred of like hating like my skin color in some way or like or what it represented, I don't know, because I think I just faced, um, you know, I never, luckily I didn't get beat up um, uh, in high school, but I did, it was weird when I was like in upstate New York, um, I had a friend, Sarah, who also lived in the trailer. She had a good friend, Lisa, who I wasn't, for some reason, Lisa's mom didn't want us hanging out, but I don't think I did anything. Like I wasn't a bad kid, I was fine, it was pleasant. So maybe it had to do with race. I don't know, but like one day they like just decided like we were playing dress up and then they decided to like punch me and kick me. It was really odd. And I don't know if it had to do with like Lisa's mom, like not liking me and saying things about me, but they, they thought it was funny to beat me up. So 
that was my only incident that I can point to that like was maybe a racially motiv motivated violent moment. Um, I was okay physically. I, like they weren't very strong. We were all little kids, but it, I think it just emotionally scarred me more yeah, than it did sure. physically for sure. Where you are now may not be where you came from. The choices you make today may spiral out of control or spin you in the right direction. Discover a riveting, true story of how Carlos Vieira nearly destroyed his life and lived to tell about it. Stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness. Knocking doors down along the way. And don't miss others telling their powerful stories on our podcast. Visit kddmediacompany.com. Life is hard enough, and we all can have those negative voices oftentimes, you know, when we talk with people here on any recovery level, of course, I'm included that, you know, it stems from sort of trauma situations. Yeah. Did, you, did you take those kind of situations? Because normally when I, you know, folks that I've known of an Asian background, they're not normally as outgoing, but you're, you're like, I'm an extrovert, which is so, you know, and I, and I mean, it just, you know, culturally, you know, when they, when I've gone to, like I said, uh, things with friends of mine that are Hmong, you know, within their context of their group, they're incredibly outgoing, but out in society, they operate on a different level. Was that a challenge that you had as feeling like you were an extrovert to be able to be up there and be bombastic and play these great roles and characters? Great question. Um, I think I, my personality growing up was just more loud and vocal. I still remember my parents like showing me pictures of like when we we visited New York City for the first time and there was like a street performer, like a, like a belly dancer. And I was like maybe six years old and I wanted to dance too. So I like <laughs> went next to her and was like, <laughs> you know, like trying to dance, you know? So, so you've I, always been an entertainer. Well, I guess. <laughs> always like the spotlight I guess I don't know so I think I've always been pretty extroverted um as a person um so I think that luckily uh came more naturally when it came to like acting and everything so that was something I didn't feel like I had to overcome um but I do feel like I I'm, I'm a recovering perfectionist and I think because I was so hard on myself growing up uh I, I mean yes my parents were hard on me but I was like even harder on myself than my parents and just I don't know through that and like the pressures of being like a female in an entertainment when I went to college I like gained like I had like my freshman they say the freshman 10 I had like my freshman 15 I was like very stressed I turned a lot to food I, I developed a pretty um bad eating disorder I, I uh was bulimic for many many years um, mm -hmm. um so that was something uh you know, I, I love how open you guys are about talking about, you know, your guys' past and, and things that you guys have dealt with. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I was dealing with like uh, bulimia and then also a poker addiction at the same time. Oh, what was yeah. that? I'm sorry. Poker. Uh, a poker. poker. Oh, okay. <laughs> at the same time. So it was tough because I think um, what was hard was I I kept feeling like I was broken, like I would just describe myself and I would think of myself as a broken person, um, which is not helpful. Um, and I, you know, I started studying NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming, just trying to find other solutions. Um, and I realized, you know, like we actually have all the resources within ourselves to overcome anything, like any addiction, any challenge, any obstacle. Um, but we just sometimes need support, you know, to access those resources. Yeah. What What do you think led to the the bulimia? You know, with with a lot of that angst that you said that you felt, you know, the towards the color yellow and you know your skin and that classification, that 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 makes sense. What do you think it was about about poker and gambling, um, you know, poker in general that that led towards that? And what were some of the consequences of it? Oh, um, so yeah, with the food, you know, it, I, I think it was just a mix of a lot of things like my perfectionism, um, like me, like hating, like the weight gain I had had, um, exercising a lot during the day and then eating so healthy. I like refused to cook with oil at one point. Um, and then I would like eat like all these desserts at night and then I, I would, like 
be so like mad at myself and then I started throwing up so it was just a lot of things like some self-hatred yes from all different sources um and then with the poker I I think I in some ways have a naturally addictive personality like I get very passionate about things so I think in life, I do believe that everything kind of has a yin and a yang, right? Like the things that help us and help us be successful can also be the things that can lead us to some dark moments as well. So like, I'm a very passionate person, so I get really into things. Um, and so when I was a teenager, I I don't like to be told I can't do something. Um, so I remember a friend of mine, Joe was like, well, girls can't play poker. And I'm like, yeah. And I had never played poker, but I was like, well, I create like an online poker account. I, my screen name is Girls Play Two with a number two. <laughs> and I started like playing poker online just to prove them wrong. Um, and so it was just fun and fine. But then in college, um, I met some people who, uh, my college friends got really into going to casino. And for me, I just had a hard time walking away from the table, whether I was up by a lot of money or down. And so I you know, sometimes won a lot, sometimes lost a lot. And I didn't really have a lot of money to lose. So um, I think at one point I like looked at my bank account and I had like $200 in my bank account and I was like kind of freaking out. And I had this picture in my head of like, oh my gosh, what if like this addiction gets so bad that I end up like selling my car so I could have poker money and then riding my bike buying a bike, riding it to the casino, losing all my friends, losing all my relationships because all I'm doing is like playing poker. So I, I, I did um, like the 12 step gamblers anonymous program. Um, I, I was in that for a little bit. I did some 12 step eating programs as well. So uh, I remember at one of the, um, uh, the Gamblers Anonymous meetings, there was a woman that shared that she, her friend who also had like a, a gambling addiction um, had like the previous week uh, been pulling an all-nighter, um, maybe playing for like, I don't know, maybe 30 hours or something at a time. And maybe had taken some stimulants to stay awake and literally like her heart stopped and she died. Like literally died at the table while she was gambling. And I was like, oh dear. <laughs> I'm like, Oh man, like this could be me. Like yeah. that could be me. Um, so it, and it was bad. I, I was like, sometimes I'm like, oh, well, I'll go to the casino because at least when I'm gambling, I don't eat as much. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, I'm yeah. to, like, like, Your mind's me. not exactly focused on food at the casino. I mean. You know, <laughs> welcome to it. I mean, that's the brain where people don't understand. You know, they're like, why wouldn't you just have like one or two beers? why i could have 12 or 18 why not you know and it's like people just don't don't get her the way that we would justify it it's like well i'm i'm drinking this much at home so i'm not driving so other people are safe but it's like yeah you're still you know like in your case yeah but you're still 200 dollars left in your bank account and freaking the you know what out mm -hmm. yeah no for sure uh and so much of it is it becomes like the things that we the pattern it becomes physical too it's not just like mental and it's not and I think a, a couple of things come to mind is like your environment, which like has a huge role in shaping who you are and who you become. So like the more I was hanging out with poker players <laughs> and friends being friends with them, like the more poker I was playing, right? Like the more enablers there, what, there were in my life. So it's like choosing who to spend time with. Like I, I you know, luckily I, I haven't had like an alcohol addiction um, before. But like the times I, I would date someone who just enjoy partying and drinking more, well, I just naturally drink more. And um, my fiance right now has never ever had alcohol in his life. So I drink maybe like once a month, maybe once every two months. Um, and so I, I do think environment has such a, a large role in being specific about like, who do we want to be and who are the people we get to surround ourselves with to that helps us be the people we want to be. So that plays a factor for sure. It is, you know, I know the change for me, no, you know, not going to the bars anymore or something, those people just kind of disappeared, you know, stop gambling, those people just kind of disappeared. <laughs> yes, yes. But, and then I, I was gonna say, but with bulimia, you know, that tends to be a, 
you know, a very hidden thing usually. How did you end up confronting that? You you mentioned going to some programs, but what were the changes maybe for anyone out there that's listening that is struggling with this same issue that, that worked and were effective for you? Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, I would be lying if I said, like, I never deal with food issues. Um, sure. that um, however, I think for me, I, I, I just every I wanted everything yesterday in my life, like all, results with acting, um, food, weight loss, everything, right? It's like I just was always in a hurry. And I just wish like back then I did what I do now, which is like just having a more long-term approach to like if you do if you do want to lose some weight, you know, is to um see it as a longer term thing, not like, oh, I need to drop like 10 pounds in like two months, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. that's where all the yo-yo dieting and everything comes in um so i think there's so much <laughs> that can help uh where do i um so yeah having more of a long-term perspective um i think a lot of it is like how do you stop yourself from beating yourself up i think that's yeah. big. like with the beating yourself up then i would eat more and more and more and more because i'm like well i already fucked up right mm -hmm. um like how do we take care of ourselves and be gentle with ourselves and like things I do like like in college like I hated my body I had just every mirror I would pass I would like sneak a look just to see if like my legs were as big as I thought they were in my head you know just like all those like really terrible things that are like that like each time you do it it's really subconsciously hurting you and like I'll do things like nowadays is like part of my um, daily routine is spending a minute in front of the mirror and like saying loving things about myself and my body you know like thank you legs for like being so strong and like helping me play sports and you know my knee is recovering from like like a ongoing injury that i've had from like you know like being grateful for your body and like looking at yourself acknowledging yourself and like loving it mm -hmm. does help <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's a, it's that big part of, you know, anyone that goes through any sort of recovery is the gratitude, you know, and and being thankful for your own problems. You know, like you said, it's like, yeah, I got a knee injury, but I can walk, yeah. uh, you know, I can speak, I can hear, I can do all these things and people forget that and just lose the gratitude of self. I mean, this is the only you that's ever going to use, so might as well enjoy it. Yes, absolutely. And I think it's um, there was for me uh, kind of an interesting story, so I'll share. So there was a moment where I, for the most part, like got rid of my gambling addiction. Do you guys want to hear that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I was going through my NLP training, which is neuro linguistic programming. So it's just all about like how we create the habits that we do, how to change those habits. And I remember we were doing this parts integration exercise, which is like a part of you wants one thing, a part of you wants something else, right? It's a typical conflict. And there's an NLP exercise that um, my trainer, Matt, was demoing. He was like, hey, anyone want to volunteer? And I was like, ooh, ooh, me. And so he's, he was questioning people and figuring out who he wanted to bring up as his demo. I'm like, me. And he was like, okay, well, what's your what's your um, dilemma? I'm like, well, part of me um, wants to, it feels like I should just stop playing poker completely. And then, and he was like, okay. And he was like, in the other part, I'm like, well, the other part of me is like, well, can I play poker? but just use NLP and other um, things to discipline myself so I have more discipline when I play poker so it doesn't get out of hand. And he was like, okay. So he started asking me questions and he's like, well, why is poker a problem? Like, he's like, well, what's the problem? Like, what do you, like, why is this an issue? And so as he asked questions, I could tell that he was kind of against the poker. So I got defensive. Like I, I was like, well, but if I, okay, yes, it gets a little out of hand, but like, control myself and if I could just be disciplined like using these tools like maybe I could maybe I can make it work and then he saw all the resistance the defensiveness come up and he said something to me that ended up changing my life he said Jonah um I'm going to ask you a question but you have to promise me that you will not answer out loud and I was like okay all right and he said does the part of you that wants to play poker does that part want to be disciplined? And I opened my mouth because I always have an answer for everything. And then I remembered my promise. So I shut my mouth. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> 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 I 
I just kind of sat away. I was not selected to be part of the part of integration, which is fine. But I just really sat there for the next five minutes, like really thinking about that question. Um, and then what I came to realize uh, for myself was that like this part of me that wanted to play poker and wanted to gamble really only existed to be reckless and careless and risk taking. Like that was why I think it was there. So then the idea of like trying to discipline it and control it just sounded ridiculous. Um, and so I made a decision right then and there that like I wasn't going to ever enter a casino in Los Angeles again. Cause I would, I used to pull all nighters. I'd only leave only if I had something in the morning and that I had to. So I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll, you know, play everyone's old friends or in Vegas, but I will not step into a casino in Los Angeles. Um, and for me, it was easier to stop than it was to try to, you know, to play a little and stop myself. Like I think that self-awareness of like really being, <clears throat> and for me, it's, it's, it's the same with food sometimes. It's like, I know that this will be harder for me to stop eating this bread if I start than if I didn't stop it, if I didn't start at all. So I'm just going to choose not to eat it right now. Yeah. So that, that moment in that training, uh, I think I consider myself extremely lucky um, because I think that was a fork in the road for me. Like my life, I don't know if I'd be alive, honestly, to this day, um, had I not gone through that. 5150 is power. The power to overcome. The power to persevere. The power to set your life on a course for success. When you're faced with the challenges life throws at you, you focus and do what is needed to go beyond what is required. So stand up, stand firm, believe, make it happen, and live through the madness knocking doors down along the way. We are 5150. Yeah, well, it's, it just shows the power of confronting these things because, you know, any sort of addiction is powerful. We lie to ourselves than others in turn. And when we get those good aha moments like you had, it's like, oh, wow, you know, because gambling, you can stop food. I can't, I, you know, I've kind of been the opposite where, you know, I've had it when I was active in my addiction, I would go a day or two without eating. I would drink, but I would go a day or two without it. And so for me, it's kind of been that thing of, we can go without booze or gambling, but we can't go without food and sustenance. So that's a totally different challenge in itself. I just have to eat. I'm the opposite. It's like, you know, eat guy, let's go. Whereas for you, it's a totally different situation. Yes, absolutely. And so for me, like the poker was easier for me to find solutions to because yeah, it's, again, it's like that environment too, right? It's like, I. I would have to physically, which I did many times, drive to the casino versus food, which is kind of just all around us everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, jo Joanna, uh, we tend to finish off, we leave the guests with the last encouraging words, but before that, we're gonna do some random questions, but we do have one more gentleman's bet because I, I lost the first one, how to pronounce your last name. Come on. Okay. I'm, I'm an idiot. Uh, we know that you are a competitive woman. You couldn't be successful in the acting industry if you weren't competitive, love to challenge, but you also love to play board games, as do I. So we guessed, what is your favorite board game? Oh, Ooh. oh, you want me to answer? Or you yeah, yeah. yeah, what is your favorite board game? Because we've each taken a guess. I really like a game called Resistance, which is like what we're in Mafia. We both lost, we both lost. What did you guys guess? He said checkers and he said Scrabble. I said Scrabble. I oh. wanted it to just be a simple, basic answer. I wanted you to just like be competitive. I love all board games, but what's your favorite? Checkers. <laughs> That's what I wanted. I'm so awful at Scrabble and checkers, it doesn't do it for me. <laughs> If you're over seven years old, nobody likes checkers. All right, Jonah, you don't need to kick me when I'm down. I get it. I lost that one. But then again, so did you. So I'm still too. up one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I picked Scrabble because, A, you seem far more intelligent than me, and I'm dyslexic, and I suck at that game. There is no point in playing it. That's also why I would mess up, like, you know, other names, because I look at everything phonetically. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, all right, Jonah, we got some fun uh, random questions uh, before we leave you with the last words, all right? Sure. Maggie. 
if you could travel anywhere in time, but you had to stay there, where would it be and why? Am I allowed to travel into the future? Sure. Yes. Future, past, stay in the present. I would love to travel into the future, maybe like 100 years, because um, I'm hoping that society moves in a good direction, lots of advancement, people living longer. Yes. Yeah. That's it. No, I'm with you on that one. I always said, uh, people always ask me why I'm so interested in like science fiction, especially the world of Gene Roddenberry with Star Trek. I'm like, because the way everybody treats each other, you know? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, all right, pet peeves. What annoys that you know what out of Jonah? When I get ghosted. <laughs> <laughs> just like people, not like, just, I just don't understand why people, I get it, it's like we don't have a relationship, but like, let's say like we've talked before, just in some, or whatever the situation, um, we kind of know each other. I think people are just so scared of saying no to people. You know what I mean? We're like, oh, I'm not interested. Uh, where I, I'm literally like, hey, if I'm bugged, like, if you're not interested, just let me know and I'll yeah. talk. And then they still don't reply. And I'm like, all right, well. So that, that's, I, I, it's a pet peeve of mine. I'm like, just say, just say no. <laughs> or just be yeah. like, oh, I'm not interested and I'll, yeah. I'll leave you alone. Because I, I'm so, I'm, I am a little bit aggressive. I'm aggressive with grace. I try to be so, I'm someone who follows up with people and like, you know, I don't assume that they saw my message. Like maybe they missed it. Maybe they were driving. But then sometimes I'm like, nah, you're just, you're just ignoring me. Fine. I'll, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're just a jackass. But hey, you get the laugh because you're engaged now. So any of those dudes that goes to you, screwed up. <laughs> so you're good to go now. <laughs> so if, if you bump into quote unquote Carl sometime, he's like, hey, we should get a drink. Screw you, Carl. Engage. See that? Bye. I'll use that one. I'll use that one. Uh, yeah. You can give them the peace out, bitches. <laughs> All right, Mikey. I was, I was waiting for you to finish. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I was on a rant. All right. If you were stuck on a deserted island, what one movie and one album would you bring? Oh, movie and an album. Oh, God. This is hard. For the um, rest of your life on an island well we don't it's, necessarily it's my rest, question but you're just stuck it's my question the right, rest of God. your life i'm gonna go now thank you <laughs> oh a movie dang um i would imagine i would want something upbeat if i'm on an island yeah something positive i would assume right you can yeah. say right in the last dragon Ryan the last i was thinking about that I, I was expecting you to say that i was expecting yeah. this it's really it's it's got good messages and it's funny and it's great um and then album oh man uh i really um i, I like leonard skinner um nice. with Jan stevens in terms of artists so maybe something of theirs i'm terrible with names of albums so don't ask me for that <laughs> <laughs> you're totally good i love people that refer to a song as track nine <laughs> that used to be the thing back in the day um ba -ba -ba. okay um what is your favorite curse word you did drop the f-bomb with us but what is your favorite curse word probably fuck yeah that's a good one you can no. use it in so many different ways yes, exactly yeah. it's the versatility i had a college friend who got into i think it was usc he wrote a whole essay on the word fuck like a whole <laughs> essay all about the word fuck <laughs> I was like, wow, this is impressive. Well, like I said, it's like you get a present or something. Oh, fuck. That's awesome. Or like, fuck. You know, like it's just, it's so. It's not like, fuck. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a great video on YouTube where it's like how it's a noun, a verb, an adjective, mm -hmm. an adverb. It's, it's oh, yeah. just brilliant. Um, any guilty pleasures? Uh, sometimes I'll watch shows like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Um, oh yeah, that's a guilty pleasure. Oh, I also, okay, okay. I also on social media, when I see like a juicy post, 
um, I'll like, I'll, I'll, I'll know that there's trolls and I just want to see what, like, I, I'm just curious. I go down the rabbit hole. I'm like, oh, damn. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're <laughs> like, fuck. <laughs> a little time looking at it and being entertained. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, we like to leave our guests with the final word. Yeah. So uh, what, you know, words of encouragement, all that good Anyone stuff? Anyone that struggled with, obviously, you know, you coming out with sharing with us about the gambling, the bulimia, I, and especially right now with what's going on in our culture being, you know, yeah. uh, you know, of Asian descent, that food. But any words that you have? Yeah, um, I think just to know that, like, no one is broken. There's nothing, like, I believe inherently wrong with any of us. So I think reach out for support. Tell, I think share with your closest friends that you feel comfortable with. Like, let them know what you're dealing with. Let them help you. Because I think so often, like, we live in a society that's about, like, being fiercely independent, which is great. And it really hurts us when we should really be asking for support, joining communities, um, reaching out for help. Um, I think that that's a big one is to ask people for help if you are open to working with a professional you know asking around seeing if there is a therapist of some of some someone that you can work with and just knowing that like any there's a solution to every problem um, that you're facing so um i'm sure someone out there has uh, uh overcome something with whatever you're dealing with but even worse and they've succeeded so so can you so instead of why can't I and beating yourself up, like step into the place of how can I? And and really ask yourself that question and go from there. We need to ask ourselves better questions if we want better answers. Absolutely. Well, Jonah, uh, give us again, uh, you know, the, the, the movie that's out now on, uh, on Disney. Any other upcoming projects that we got to look forward to as well? Yes. Um, so it's Raya and the Last Dragon. You can get it on Disney Plus with Premier Access right now. It's also in... Um, a good number of theaters. So um, that's great. And then I, uh, there's a superhero show that will be coming out in May that I'm a part of. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, and then in the fall, um, you'll see me recur as Daisy, a working class woman who um, has some grit and is dealing with lots of really tough situations um in high town season two so it's like this uh crime drama on stars yeah so, so that's on stars yeah uh, it's juicy and lots of shit happens so. <laughs> <laughs> i encourage um anyone to watch season one uh to catch up and i'm really grateful to be part of season two awesome Sweet. well you are totally kick-ass we appreciate this very much hopefully when this pandemic uh, shuts down we can do one of these in person but we really appreciate your time thank you for being so vulnerable and keep up the amazing work thank you both so much you guys are so fun and i love the banter you guys have uh with each other too <laughs> so thank you for being so entertaining and for asking some really great questions 